Good afternoon and greetings from Pakistan. Thank you so much, Eva, for all the kind words you said. And I have to say, I'm truly honored to be included among luminaries who have received the coveted Jane Drew Prize. And the names were mentioned to you, and they're really amazing women who've done so much wonderful work. If truth be told, I feel a bit of an intruder, I have to say. Uh, having given up my practice some 20 years ago and pursuing a mid-course correction by foregoing iconic extravagance in order to pursue democratic architectural norms which could be considered non-architecture by some. Uh, and uh, on hearing the news, I was surprised to be included among lifetime creators of stellar architecture. I'm engaged in heritage conservation as well as humanitarian assistance. And uh, basically, as you can see, it is a not-for-profit organization and basically incorporating spirit of volunteerism and commitment to causes. Uh, we won a few awards, which have, of course, helped us in creating uh, more uh, stake in the work that we do. And uh, as you can see also, uh, Pakistan has extremely rich cultural heritage. There's the tangible heritage, goes back to the Bronze Age, and there are several different kinds of uh, um, civilizations that have been there, and so we are really custodian of some amazing kind of uh, um, tangible heritage, but also intangible heritage, which is to do with Sufi traditions and spiritualism, folklore and oral history, folk traditions, diverse crafts. And then let's not forget, there's the, the whole sort of voluntary tradition that exists also, which are really to do with locally sourced materials and utilizing age-old wisdom. And uh, this is all that I've been learning from and trying to apply in the work that I do. So last November, among uh, other eminent uh, experts, uh, humanitarian architect Eric Cecil of Social Design Circle was attending our Intibar Pakistan International Conference at the World Heritage uh, Site of Makli. And I introduced him to Nayar Ali Dada, saying, meet the best known architect of Pakistan. And he looked at me and said, but Yasmin, I thought you were the one. And I'm and mindful of the general perception, I had to correct him that Nayar was actually a famous star architect, while I was, I was only a barefoot one. So this is where I'm coming from, because I always thought what I'm doing is perhaps non-architecture. <clears throat> So it is gratifying that where the prize recognizes women's special perspectives, sensitivities, and approaches, at the same time equalizes both star and barefoot architecture or non-architecture. I'm grateful to the prize judges who by elevating the status of barefoot architect, such as myself, have championed a stratagem to transform the perceptions and mindsets regarding how architects and architecture need to deal with the complexities presented by the rapidly emerging realities of a post-colonial world order. Uh, so uh, a world that due to the accumulation of wealth among the 1%, as underscored by the bestseller French economist Thomas Piketty, is afflicted with rising disparities within our societies, both yours and mine, both the industrial as well as the developing world. The impact of global warming, the impact of global warming, recurring disasters and climate emergencies, climate change migrants and conflict impelled camps for the displaced are a few of the challenges that we are con confronted with today. And above all, a world in which one in eight persons goes hungry every night. Let us also not forget that most of South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa are unlikely to meet UNDP's SDGs. Anybody knows SDGs? Sustainable Development Goals uh, by 2030. That is the target. But I doubt if many of them will be able to reach it. So do such revelations impel us, especially the design professionals, and I believe lots of you are here today, uh, to pay attention to the other 99% for providing both social and ecological justice? Could we consider ourselves to be the chosen ones to devise green, sustainable, participatory design processes, as well as rights-based development, to not only work towards the well-being of the people at the same time, prevent the depletion of the planet's resources? For as we hanker 
for democratization, the force of nature is com compelling us to minimize the creation of autocratic, iconic edifices. Instead, perhaps, it is the scaled down, innovative green alternatives that will lead us to an equitable world. And considering the damage many of us might have inflicted upon the planet, myself included, we all need to work out ways of stitching this frayed tapestry of what we call Earth, the only one that we have for humankind. And like their past, I don't believe architects need to seek patronage from the Medici's of Florence, the merchant princes of industrial revolution, or East India Company's robber barons, nor today's powerful multinationals. But to focus on the poor and the displaced and the dispossessed who can benefit equally from good design to attain social justice and dignified living. Uh, sometimes people feel that if they are poor, they probably don't need any design in their lives. But I can assure you that as much as the elite and the rich need design, so do the poor. And that's where the, uh, that's where the drawback is, they are not getting it. And only architects can provide that, I believe. So uh, this is about my barefoot ecosystem. <clears throat> Last September, I was delivering a keynote during the Venice Biennale on the theme of the broken planet. There's so much talk now about how to heal the planet and, of course, degrowth and all the other movements that are taking root. They're not uh, really widespread yet, but I think the time will come when everybody will have to think about that. So this focused on the use of my barefoot model as a mechanism for healing the planet. I found that many in the audience were perplexed and asked, why barefoot? I had to respond, it is because the work I do today is with people who walk barefoot. They have no shoes. I had overlooked that in affluent countries such as yours, nobody is used to people walking without shoes at all. Of course, in my country, a vast number are barefoot because of lack of resources. But walking barefoot also had the recompenses. It keeps you close to the earth and in direct contact with the soil at all times. And it is perhaps the underlying reason why many of Pakistan's age-old vernacular traditions are based on judicious use of the earth's resources. I believe that the poor also have a, a whole uh, sort of economy and market that exists that we are not actually making use of. And if we were to be able to concentrate on the needs, on their unmet needs, there's much that can be done without too much money. So basically I'm trying to do uh, things which will cost very little, but pe that people can afford themselves. And that's where good design comes in very useful, because then you can think about how to uh, fulfill the objectives according to the context and according to the needs. So uh, over the last years, in my struggle to articulate a people's humanistic architecture as part of rights-based development, incorporating attributes of social and ecological justice, a schematic that I call barefoot social architecture or Baza has shaped the ecology of my work. Baza is akin to social engineering for bringing about social change, incorporating environmental, cultural, and technical dimensions. On the one hand, Baza seeks to democratize architecture that provides people with well-being and self-esteem. On the other, it has partiality for zero carbon footprint. And there are a few of the examples. Uh, this is on the left is a, an, a, you know, a, a kind of vernacular construction that I've utilized instead of using wood, I, I use bamboo. And then there's another one here where you have this amazing conical form of the roof, and uh, this is kind of neo vernacular, if you like. And all of these buildings just use earth and bamboo and lime. So, so now, what is Baza? Uh, it's uh, like maximizing the potential of uh, the, the barefoot uh, ecosystem composed of those at the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, number two, zero carbon humanistic architecture, fostering pride, dignity, and well-being. Number three, delivery of unmet needs through the barefoot incubator for social good and environmental sustainability. And four, adoption of non-engineered structures for shrinking the carbon footprint. Anybody ever built a non-engineered structure in this, in this hall? Ever tried it? Please do, it's very interesting and very enjoyable. 
because <laughs> we are so much kind of, you know, into doing everything that is calculated that must be done in that way. So I think now we need to start maybe opening up the whole field a little bit more. <clears throat> so in, even in today's world, it has taken decades to realize the special point of view that women bring to the table, as we heard today. This prize is therefore highly coveted as it recognizes women's role in the built environment. The women's perspective is even more significant in developing countries. I don't know whether you, I suppose you must know that, how marginalized women are in countries like mine, where women have traditionally suffered from discrimination and neglect and need champions to campaign for their aspirations. And that's where women professionals can come in because they can understand the problems and issues of other women who are marginalized much better. So, oops. Uh, for me, among the most important tasks is to create solutions which go beyond the physical structure and seek to provide dignity for women. Because you can build something, but does it really serve the purpose of elevating the status of women in some way? So women are the custodians and minders of the next generation. Unless we are able to provide them with self-respect and importance, we continue to work within an impaired system. Uh, in my work today, uh, it is women who are spearheading transformation within their society by learning zero carbon and ancient ceramic craft skills, making Mother Earth products such as natural organic soap, dung or sawdust briquettes, charcoal toothpaste, plantation and food security endeavors, clean earthen Pakistan chula stoves for health and, and uh, bamboo and thatch projects. So this is, I just brought some slides to show you how women are getting involved in doing things and the kind of uh, uh, products they're making, not for the rich, but for the poor. What I tell them is don't worry about the elite. We are, you know, you don't have to bother about them because the whole uh, ecosystem, the barefoot ecosystem is so huge. There's so much, so, such a big market there. We need to really uh, make them make products for the poor and they seem to be doing well. In the project that we did last year where something like 230 uh, mostly women, but also men, were trained in barefoot skills. And I am very pleased to report to you that 70% uh, of them have risen above the poverty line in the last 14 months. So my barefoot model seems to be working, which I am very happy about. So in, uh, now they are spe spearheading transformation within their society by learning the zero carbon and ancient crafts, etc. And now, uh, today, I no longer wish to be known as the author of my work. This is the effect that I've got from the work I've been doing. For it is only a platform and a canvas that I create in a lexicon fashioned by earth, lime, and bamboo, which is then amplified with drawings and colors by the participants, but in which I can take pride only as a collaborator. Thus, the owners become equal partners in design. And this is how they do it. You know, if this was concrete or, or burn brick or materials like that, they would not have had the courage even to express their creativity. But here you see it's mud and earth that they are used to. And look at the design, uh, creative design that they, they come up with. So and you, this is a, on the left is a, is a hand pump. And then this is the zero carbon earthen Pakistan chula that I designed. And if I show you the next slide, on the left is what the women make of it. Uh, on the one hand, I use sustainable materials such as earth, lime, and bamboo, all materials that are renewable and are locally sourced and therefore are highly sustainable. These also provide the most economical combination for construction. This means that even when I build my, you know, my non-engineered structures in vast numbers, and uh, I know you said 40,000, but actually it's now 50,000, shelters and about 60,000 award-winning earth uh, stoves and other elements that have benefited something like 0.84 million people since 2012. In fact, between 2012 and 2018. These are being zero carbon, these have not hurt the planet. One of the zero carbon structures, and you can see no carbon emissions, no trees are felled, 1750 villages covered, 300,000 persons were housed, and materials are only locally sourced, clay, lime, and bamboo. And now let's compare it to this slide. This is an engineered structure. You can look at the cost as well. You know, our Zero carbon costs very little. This one costs quite a bit. And then look at the damage it does. And uh, this, is, this is actually calculated by, the, by an international consultant 
that says that deforestation of something like over 50,000 uh, acres of forest ha happens because of that. So we have to be very mindful as to the materials that we now use today. <clears throat> so, uh, okay, I'd like now to make a plea to architects to use their innovative skills for creating non-engineered zero or low carbon structures. The ones I build are for the marginalized so that they are very simple, but these could equally be quite spectacular if uh, designed by really good architects and designers, uh, which would be built for 1% even, and why not? If the poor can live in sustainable structures, so can the rich, I would imagine, if they are properly designed. So this is the zero carbon campus that we have set up that provides training in zero carbon green construction and craft skills for the marginalized. And I just want to show you a couple more slides of that. This is an Intabar center again, uh, made out of bamboo and lime and, uh, and earth. And this is inside the big, uh, what we call the zero carbon uh, cultural center. And that's how we have hold really big conferences here as well. And uh, what I just wanted to share with you that we'll be starting lots of workshops for working in low carbon materials uh, where there'll be students coming in from Pakistan but also from abroad. And uh, I would like to extend an invitation to all of you to visit Pakistan and come and see us at Makli. It's a World Heritage Site, it's something fantastic and you'll be able to see all this that's going on. In conclusion, I would like to thank W Awards, Architects Journal and Architectural Review for the singular honor and also Ellie and uh, these for making arrangements for my visit. I would I like also to thank all of you for being here and patiently listening to me, and also my two sisters who've come across two oceans, one from Pakistan, another one from Canada, who are here with, with us today. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping that through this, you will all help me to take my zero carbon mission forward. Thank you so much. Thank you.